the city of the sun. Our grandmother's lost history. The Mississippi River, one of the world's major river systems in size, habitat diversity, and biological productivity. It's a significant power in the economy of the U.S. About 200 million tons of freight travel on this river each year. The river's watershed being responsible for nearly 4 million square kilometers, half of the fresh water of the Amazon. 60% of all grains exported from the U.S. are shipped via the river. Resource conflict is not restricted to this relatively new U.S. culture, but existed among the native tribes. Almost 300 species of fish, 25% of all fish species in the U.S., 40% of the nation's migratory waterfowl use this river corridor. Not restricted to contemporary U.S. culture, resource conflict existed among the tribes, raiders, both European and native, as well as settlers. Trading pre-U.S. culture included tobacco, mate, grains and seed, game, feathers, ergonomic objects such as baskets, clothing, copper, and fur. The Algonquin Trading Confederacy maintained trade agreements within the nations. Trading goods within the North, Mid, and Southern continent. Trade subject to individual policies nation to nation due to the scale of the river territory. Believed to have begun when the raiding invasions began with the adaption and refinement of weaponry. This revolutionized how hunting and disputes were settled. Obscured by visual protection, this combatant proved superior to clubs and throwing rocks and is difficult to remove. Medina style points are an important adaptation for both food and protection. Stone celts and wooden maces are abundant in historic archaeological records. Atlatls, knives of wood, cane, shell, stone, and bone for hunting as well as protection in disputes. A bifacial knife that can be used dually post-hunt or for enemies. No Aboriginal record produces sufficient evidence to support a warring society. Copper instruments and iron-based pigments from the southern latitudes have been identified in furring trade. Researchers conclude that this knife was used in ceremony, not utilitarian in nature. Archaeologists propose the weapons recovered are for ritual display. This idea runs parallel with effigy mounds or pyramids. One must consider agreed upon tariffs or tributes maintaining diplomatic consistency. Inhabitants from the City of the Sun and Lower U.S. exhibit trauma indicative of a low violence arena. Disputes do surface under forensic analysis. Three of 265 individuals display injuries unhealed consistent with violent death. Trophy pathology is well documented and inferred for a number of individuals recently excavated. Though no blunt or sharp force cranial trauma in a sample of 564 remains. Interpersonal violence is not identified presently at the Spiro site. Six of 52 at Child express what is believed to be paramortem trauma. Few Mississippi Valley skeletons excavated expose skeletal trauma. This begins our novel observation. 
that the City of the Sun and the Aboriginal territories of the North, Mid, and Southern Continent, referred to as our grandmother, participated in a constitution that covered more territory than was previously believed. This constitution had many contingencies for trade, including mining, tools, foods, essentials, tobacco, feather, fur, textiles, possibly slaves. It is not evident that slavery was part of disputes, though it is widely acknowledged as part of the Southern Hemisphere's culture. Trade evidenced through the oral traditions as well as the objects themselves. Objects, if attributed to another culture before the turn of the common era, would remain priceless. These objects looked over due to their pure utilitarian nature, objects void of the perversions of dispute and war. A culture that reveres its elders, accepts individuality, and often welcomes travelers. It is possible that the restrictive nature of other culture found on the sphere at the time is also present. Our grandmother, as the lands were referred to, evidence thus far does not confirm this. It is possible one must be aware of what one is projecting. The ethnocentric filter one places upon the culture one is observing culture possibly more pure, more moral, more conscious in efforts to exist day to day. One can conclude it is worth investigating whether skeletons, predominantly female, were buried as an homage or effigy post-childbearing death, or were in fact part of a larger ritual that may have infiltrated the northern territories during trading can surmise an established trade route was regularly monitored and maintained. Roaming nomadic raiders, clans, tribes, whether local continental or seafaring northern Europeans, would engage in conflict that could produce similar archaeological results. One must remember researchers use different methods to calculate trauma frequencies with methodologies not always comparable. Mississippi Valley skeletal samples exhibit a low frequency of warfare-related violence. Three out of 259 at Dallas Phase and nine out of 272 at Mouse Creek display scalping or projectile trauma. Territorially, trauma is particularly high in small and medium sites in what is presently Alabama. Six out of 108 skeletons at Kroger Island, with 11% violent mortality in samples at Tibby Creek under the age of 15 appear to be infrequent targets in these attacks, commonly male and with evidence of warfare damage. It's been argued that the Mississippi Valley demographic victim varies regionally, which would lead one to observe that female directed violence is more infrequent in southern territories disparities could be the result of a joint constitution and more adhered to in the western and eastern territories, possibly due to the prestige associated with killing male warriors as opposed to female counterparts. Through social sanctioning, violence towards women is generally discouraged. Recent examinations in the Mississippi Valley do not support the male bias trend towards violence. 
Arguments quote De La Vega's account of war among the Aboriginal nations encountered by the Eurocentric expedition of De Soto observing hostility among the tribes. No attempt to seize property and with a goal to inflict desired damage. This is a single historic account. Attempts to reconcile materialist and social explanations for Mississippi Valley warfare. Eurocentric economic models of materialism. It is a possible link to the instability of chiefdom organization, leading to high levels of warfare within the clans. Trade disputes would also explain the increased warfare at the City of the Sun, appearing to be an epicenter of trade for the continent's north, central, and southern regions. Factional competition, trade disputes, and environmental stresses could cause pyramid and mound centers to intensify political anxiety. Eruptions appear abnormal, supporting an idea of general cooperation and an effective constitution, not forgetting the sophisticated and intricate moral connotations, or the cooperation involved in maintaining the world's largest herd of bison, estimated conservatively at over 50 million head. Maintained by the border tribes as well as the central Midwestern clans. Complex chiefdom created a constitution that was a moral code, participated in by many of the Aboriginal nations. Within the first millennia of the Common Era, the clans altered a number of behaviors. The introduction and perfection of bow and arrow, and the change of settlement patterns participated in building effigy pyramids or mounds. Groups participating in effigy mounds are nomadic, autonomous, interrelated hunter-gatherers, sharing the landscape with other stationary groups, building substantial halls and homes in hamlets and palisaded villages, Cultural and historical trajectory is often misunderstood, underappreciated, or rendered through an ethnocentric filter, particularly in transition from Lake Woodland to Mississippi Valley. Commonality in diet joins different groups on a continuum of non-maize-dependent foragers to maize-dependent agriculturalists. Seed and grain in the botanical assemblage are limited in determining the importance of any particular plant. Isotopic analysis are well suited to the application because they provide standardized values that are directly related to the amount of grain consumed. The nations lived during an agricultural boom. Persistent droughts throughout the Midwest region between 1100 and 1300 Common Era have been associated with the increase in raids and social disruption at the City of the Sun, or Cahokia. It is unclear whether Cahokia were the raiders that resettled the once thriving Continental Trading Center or assimilated the lifestyle adapting the culture of this location. Palisade around the central district proves difficult to identify a true date of decline. The increased construction of palisades and fortification suggests inconsistent resource availability. Fortification specifically is also associated with higher frequencies of lethal projectile injuries indicating resource and population stresses as a main source of ongoing disputes. 
Synchronic and diachronic patterns of dispute may be attributed to the rating of vital trade routes that supported the City of the Sun. Shrines or pagodas contain ancestral human remains. Hall or temple desecration dissolves the ancestral links that form the ideological basis for authority among the clans or tribal chieftains. Sites maintain grains such as seeds and rice as their staple, with corn production not increasing until much later. Drying of grain provides a subsistence economy, susceptible to trade disputes. Some researchers argue the City of the Sun at the site of the present-day Cahokia represents an early state. One can imagine it could be a re-inhabited locale, particularly due to the excavations found within the bounds and burial sites. A unique position within the organization of language continuity and trade participating in continental culture and communication. The City of the Sun, our grandmother's lost history.